Daily Dusan Vlahovic rumours are back. Allegedly, Jokerez has made the decision on his future. We've been linked with a talented Brazilian who plays for Corinthians. We've also been linked with Alfonso Davies. So there's a lot of isms and schisms for us to get into. If I share my screen, let's see exactly what's now being said where the tabloids are concerned with the football club we love. Arsenal among surprise suitors for transfer that hints at major tactical change by Mikel Arteta. Arsenal reportedly one of a number of clubs looking at Alfonso Davies' situation at by Munich at the moment along with other Premier League sides. It's not clear yet where Davies will be playing his football next season as he nears the end of his contract at Bayern Munich or better yet the Allianz Arena but it seems the Gunners could be a name to watch out for. The Can Canada International would undoubtedly be a tempting option for many big clubs if he becomes a free agent with Liverpool apparently his most likely destination if he is to move to the Premier League according to the Athletic. However, their report also mentions Arsenal as well as others like Real Madrid, Barcelona, United and Chelsea. I mean, naturally for obvious reasons, if Alfonso Davies did become something feasible for Arsenal I think they would listen. Obviously, he's a good player. We, you know, Arteta loves a fullback. While we seem quite stocked at fullback at the moment you can make a case of, you know, Lewis Skelly who's doing quite well. Maybe he's got a future in midfield and we need to give him the scope to just develop, even though I'd love him to play against Everton. Tommy Asu's injury record, the club might have enough of move you on. Kivio, who's an option at centre-half and a left-back, could be moved on. Sinchenko's got two years left on his deal. It seems like there's radio silence where renewal's there. Timbo's getting over his ACL injuries, but we're having to be careful. And obviously, Calafuri gets knocked. So you could make a case of signing the left-back. I don't believe this, if I'm honest with you. I just don't believe it. You know, you're linked with Barcelona. You're linked with Real Madrid. You're actually linked with staying potentially at Bayern Munich. Obviously, if Chelsea are interested, you're going to do that. I think there's a decent chance you could go Manchester United. And you can't rule out staying at Bayern Munich. So it's a nice way to kick off this video. But yeah, I don't think I'll believe that. Real Madrid have allegedly stepped up their interest in, in Trent Alexander-Arnold with Alfonso Davies thought to be closer to staying at Bayern Munich. Real Madrid do not want to waste time in any bidding wars for Davies. Exactly. And he's a quality player, but is he really that good defensively? Really? Can he do that inverted role? I don't know, people. But if, for what it's worth, if Davies said, I want to join Arsenal, I wouldn't be against it. I don't buy this. Now, as I said earlier, daily do and rumours are back people. We know we've been linked with him before. We know we need a striker. We know Juventus are struggling at this moment in time to get him to renew his contract, people. But for what it's worth, allegedly, Arsenal are preparing a January move for 70 million euro rated frontman that's made Pep's Guardiola's life a misery. I mean, you've got to love the clickbait. Mikel Arteta would appear to be in the market for a new striker and is set to make a move for Vlahovic in the January transfer window. The Gunners continue to be linked with the 24-year-old from Juventus and court offside sources indicate Arteta wants to make a splash in the new year to help Arsenal during the second half of the 2024-25 campaign. It is understood the Spaniard believes that the Serbian hitman would be the perfect striker for the way in which the team are currently playing. Would you describe him as that kind of mid that striker that's going to drop into midfield work the channels and press I don't know maybe Arteta switches up the tactics a bit like what you've seen with Pep with Harlan but it doesn't really fit the remit it seems like there's other better fits wouldn't be the worst signing though um Indeed, the expansive and sometimes direct football seen by the Gunners is a joy to watch until the final third when there's no one to put the ball in the back of the net. Having a striker that knows where the goal is will arguably elevate Arsenal's chances of being in the mix for silver at the end of the season. True, we know we're, we're all well aware of where we are in the position in the table, but it doesn't say anything beyond the fact that apparently they want to keep him. His contract is until 2026. If a new deal cannot be... Um, agreed then naturally they're gonna have to consider selling him they might let him go in january for around 70 million which is around 60 odd million pounds i'm not too sure yokarez has made a surprising decision about his future that will have a profound impact on both manchester united and barcelona he's been heavily linked with manchester united arsenal barcelona and chelsea as well as psg here people i actually still believe he's gonna go man united one week he's gonna go arsenal then it's united then it's this then it's that but allegedly Manchester United could be left disappointed in their chase for Jokeres. However, El Nacional claims that the striker is willing to wait for Barcelona to become the heir to Robert Lewandowski. Apparently, at Barca, they know that the striker would be delighted to join the Camp Nou, but for the moment, Deco does not plan to make any move. 
money issues likely to block a Jokerez deal. As you know, he's got a release clause. He could command as high as 100 million euros during January or 70 million in the summer. This figure, however, could drop if he continues to make his discontent clear with a price of 60 million euros, even discussed by the local media. So it's another one where we'll have to see people. He's linked with a bunch of clubs. Everybody kind of needs a forward. Every day presents a new kind of twist where the rumours are concerned. So we'll have to see. Um, there's been some rumours that Kivio's agent is actually trying to force him out of Arsenal in January. Keyword rumours. Apparently, Arsenal finally opened up to the idea of a loan deal for Jakob Kivio if it includes a mandatory purchase option. That's according to Matino, relayed by Area Napoli, who report on Arsenal's total opening to the idea. Napoli have been building towards a bid for Kivio for weeks, with it regular explained from from Italy that they've been working on Arsenal and the defender to convince both of them about the move. The big snag has been the Gunners stance on a loan deal. Rightly so. I mean, if you're not going to let him go permanently or with a mandatory option, I don't think it makes sense. I don't think it makes sense to let Kivio go in January unless it's an offer you can't refuse. You know, as I always say, you can make a case of several players within this team being moved on for different reasons or whatever. But does it make sense? An already depleted squad, already a tiny squad, January, which... God willing, on paper, everything is still to play for. We're still going to be in the Prem. We've still got the Champions League. The FA Cup comes into it where we play Man United. And, you you know, by God's grace, we do what we need to do against Crystal Palace and get through to the next round of the League Cup. Doesn't make sense with all of the games we've played and the games we've got coming, letting Kivu your go. But as I said, offers can be made. You never know, people. The big snag, as I said, has been the Gunners stance on a loan deal with them preferring to sell Kivio on a permanent basis, then loan him out. As of Thursday, it was still being reported that this stood in the way of a deal happening. However, reports that Napoli sporting director Giovanni Mane, Mana, apologies, definitely not Mane, would love Mane on the left-hand side for Arsenal, though, has proven successful in his attempts to bring the two parties around. The newspaper states that the opening of the defender and of Arsenal are total, but the latter have set conditions for a loan. They want Napoli to play to pay three million euros, and therefore, and then there to be an obligation to buy Kivio at the end of it. The clause could be activated about after ten to twelve games. That's an option Napoli now need to sit and consider. They're the, despite their determination to consider spending and strengthening for Conte. Kivio, for his part, allegedly wants to join a club who can guarantee him minutes, but that is something Conte cannot do at this moment in time. So then what, where, do you, where are you at with the article then? Mana continues, I think it means continues to work on the situation. I re he remains the first goal for the January transfer window. Now, Kivio is linked with uh, probably every club in Serie A and a couple in Spain. So we'll have to watch that. Apparently, people, Arsenal have made contact for Corinthians Bueno Buidon, he did 19-year-old. That is a left eight we need, in my opinion. Now, I don't buy this article because I don't think we're spending 100 million. He is still very raw. For me, he takes too many touches. He's got a good first touch, but I think sometimes, even if you just type in on YouTube, you'll see it. His first touch is baggy. But he is, if anything, that is more closely aligned to that left eight than, than what we've got, if I'm honest. So I wouldn't be against it. But as I said, he's 19. He's still raw. As you know, when it comes to these Brazilian talents, any half-decent player, you're going for 50, maybe even all the way up to 80 to 90, in some cases, 100 million, as we've seen time and time again, people. Um... So, yeah, we'll have to see. He came out of the Corinthians Academy. He's made 44 appearances in all comps, managing a golden assist. Currently, he's a Brazil under-20 international and he's on the radar of a few Premier League teams. Allegedly, Arsenal are one of those clubs and the report says Buidon's agent is aware of the English side making advancements for him. The Gunners believe his profile and quality can allow him to develop if he were to arrive at the Emirates. Back in March, Buidon signed the deal until December 2028 and that includes a 100 million release clause. So, we hope we can get him for a lower price. If he were to leave in January, the Brazilian club would bring in a replacement in the same window. I mean, bring him really, but he's a development signing. I'm not expecting fireworks right away, if I'm honest. And I, rightly or wrongly, I would love Arsenal Football Club to sign a central midfielder. I just think where you've got Declan Rice currently, Jorginho, Partey, Mikel Moreno, um, the, we don't see it, but, you know, young, you know, you do see it, but young Ethan, the option of Lewis Skelly, Zinchenko can play there. Push comes to shove, even though we haven't seen it. Kai Havertz can play there. Odegaard can play there. I don't think it's realistic to expect a central midfield signing, even though I would love one. As much as we talk about striker and winger, I do think we need that eight. Fair enough. I do think people make a big song and dance and over-exaggerate slyly. 
with Declan Rice in that eight, but come on, man, he's bread and butter's the six. Get him a partner to do that eight stuff. Anytime Declan Rice has played in the six, he's been colossal. Even when it was him and Jorginho last season, you know, you look at the Liverpool game, you look at the Monaco game, when he's been in that six, he's been different gravy. That's his bread and butter, really. But let's move on. I'm digressing. There's no way on God's green earth I can say this guy's name, but allegedly Arsenal and Chelsea show interest in goalkeeper. Go on, I'll try it for you. Look, forgive me. I mean, no disrespect. Vladislav Kaprikov, Kapritsov, forgive me for mispronunciations, man. Apparently, both teams were interested before he agreed to join Girona on Thursday, people. Apparently, he's a 19-year-old. I assume he's playing in, in, in Shakhtar or something like that. Allegedly, he underwent trials at Arsenal and Chelsea. And, then, uh, and he's a Ukraine under-19 international, convinced both clubs. But, I mean, Chelsea got a million goalies. We've just signed David Raya and there's a couple of academy kids. No clue on Girona's situation, but maybe it makes sense to go over there, people. Wish him the best. Apparently, Apparently, Nico Williams has suffered some sort of injury, people, which obviously has ramifications for if he is to leave in January or the summer, which I don't think he's leaving in January. And clearly for Bilbao and the man himself, as you know, he's been linked with Arsenal, Chelsea, Barcelona, probably a bunch of other clubs. This week, there's been rumours that Arsenal are keen to activate his release clause in January. Whether it's Adam Ola Lukman, Nico Williams, Kodos, Vlahovic, you know, if we did half of the young Brazilian lad, we really would get our act together in January and maybe even win everything, including the, the tour. The France people, so I don't know whether to take stock in that. Is there anything new here? Uh, Arsenal make total U turn as first January transfer takes shape. Okay, Arsenal have softened their stance on Kivio and are now willing to loan him out in January. Not sure on that. Does that mean Tierney stays? Does that mean Galif Califuri and Gabriel are expected to return to the four? Are we going to bring in another one? I'm kind of tired of speaking about Kivio. It's easy to link him with moves away for obvious reasons. Marcus Rashford's been told to join Arsenal. and Forget about that, man. Um, Apparently, the Gunners are set to lose star players, Victor Rice, Price named people. That's probably in relation to Partey. As we know, his contract is running out. In January, the 31-year-old will be free to talk to other clubs. There's been no real concrete evidence to suggest that there's contract talks, but there's been a little isms and schisms. Apparently, it's a stalemate between the club and Partey. Clubs across Europe and Saudi are, are said to be monitoring them. I reckon he'll go Italy, you know. I, I think either. I, I think first, I just, just don't know why. I think he'll go back to Italy. Uh, he'll go to Italy. Second choice going back to Spain. Obviously, if there's a mouth-watering offer, pause, um, from Saudi at 30 or 31 years of age, 30, 30, 31, 32 years of age, sorry, something to seriously consider. Um, not too sure on that. Apparently, Arsenal have been warned it will take 29 million to convince Palmeiras to sell Wonder Kid Victor Rice. Get it done then. What the hell? Get it done. 29 million. Get it done if we really believe in him, you know, for them Brazilian Wonder Kids. That seems to be an affordable price, really. There were two teams that talked about 30 million and Palmeiras refused. Victor Rice will be the most expensive defender in the history of Brazil. He'll be sold for around 35 million. So get it done. Palmeiras did not want to listen to Victor Rowe's proposals because they are focused on the 2025 Club World Cup. If there is anything, just like what happened with Astavia, it would be after the World Cup. So that would probably be a summer signing, as in you might be able to agree something in January, the summer of 2025. Completely off topic, people. Uh, England have been have found out who they'll be playing in the qualifying rounds of the World Cup. People have been drawn in Group K, where some groups have four teams. We've got five: Serbia, Albania, Latvia, and Andorra. With the greatest of respect, you would imagine those are walks in the park. You can't sleep on Albania, especially if you get drawn away from home. Serbia, anything can happen. But yeah, Thomas Tuchel will get to work, man. Let's go, man. Big up Santi Cazola. What would you people let me know? Like, am I wrong for thinking, yeah, we would love Cesc Fabregas? And to be fair, Patrick Vieira would, you know, if you could find someone of Patrick Vieira's profile, where, with what I'm seeing from Mikel Arteta, that would probably be the perfect midfielder, you know, the, the physical attributes to go with the technical attributes, which I feel people, not necessarily Arsenal fans, but Premier League fans, they really downplay Patrick Vieira's technical ability and how he used to glide past players in his own own right. You know, I think Mikel Arteta ideally would want a Patrick Vieira or a, y or a Yaya Toure, but those are unicorn players, as is Santi Cazola, to be fair with you. But am I wrong for thinking this is the midfield? Yeah, he played in the 10 and out wide, but, you know, towards the end of his career or whatever, he played in that central midfield for Arsenal. Am I wrong for thinking... We need someone that with that skill set now, obviously another unicorn of a footballer, probably 
obviously I'm not saying he's better than Javi Alonso, but I would throw the Santi Cazolas, the Javi Alonso's, to a degree the David Silvers, to a degree Juan Mata, these kind of midfielders that are very unfortunate to be Spanish. And what I mean by that is you've got Iniesta and Xavi, them and are the, the guys in it. I think he's one of the most un underrated players, you know, in recent years. I use that as an exaggeration. It's definitely not recent years. The man turned 40. So yeah, happy birthday, Santi. And one love, man, because when we was playing in the... 2014 FA Cup and I, me and my nephew, I took him. We was in the whole section. We was two goals down. I looked, I saw that diminutive Spanish guy g up his teammates and then you saw the rest in it. Once again, we could lose Partey for nothing, which probably the club are briefed on it. Are we? I'm tired of it even getting into and engaging in anything Zubamendi related. Quality player, but come on, we've been around the houses, ain't we? Martin Zubamendi is now open to a move um, from Sociedad, which has alerted Manchester City, Arsenal and Liverpool. Keeping it up with Zubamendi, apparently he's said to have reservations about the prospect of playing the understudy role to Rodri once he returns and could wait until the summer to determine his future, which is probably going to be the case. Uh, Arsenal were once upon a time linked with Liam Delap. Allegedly, Chelsea have initiated talks with Ipswich over a potential transfer for him. Uh, we were linked with Rafina. The Athletics said we tried to get him in the summer. He's, he's probably best he stayed at Barca. You see him what he's doing under Hansi Flick. Allegedly, Barcelona will not entertain any offers below €100 million Euros for Rafinha, with Chelsea rumoured to have made an €85 million Euros bid. Uh, Arda Galea is unlikely to leave Real Madrid in January. The Turkish star is loving his time at the club and wants to stay. Bayern Leverkusen have been linked with him this week, as have Arsenal. That's from Fabrizio Romano. What else have we got? Mohamed Salah and Bakayo Saka are the only Premier League players to reach 20-plus goals contributions across all comps this season. Mohamed Salah's got 28 GA, Bakayo Saka's got 21 GA. Quality players, man, really. And, you know, Salah wasn't doing what Saka is doing at his age. Saka, the goal for you is can you be still spoken about at Salah's age, really? It's a bit like Van Dijk and Saliba. Van Dijk weren't doing what Saliba was doing, but it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Can Saliba be in that realm when he gets to what was, what, how old is Van Dijk? Like 30, 31 kind of thing. But, if you're mentioned in the conversations at these young ages in Saka and Saliba with two world-class, top-class household names that have won stuff, you're doing all right, aren't you, people? Obviously, it's all fun and games talking about transfers. We need to worry about who's at the club. Mikel Arteta has said Arsenal need a cage to stop Calafuri from rushing his comeback, which, again, another example of when people say footballers don't care, it annoys me. Yeah, you can argue the medical staff could do better or worse, but we know with the Benjamin Whites, the Califuris, you could extend that to Tommy Asu. Maybe they're rushing themselves back. We all know he's missed our last two games. And Mikel Arteta did say he's him and Gabriel have been carrying issues from when the last international break. It's crazy, people. He's been a good player for us, but yeah, he picked up this knock in September and has been struggling. And he had a knee injury, knee injury issue in October. He has missed nine games already this season. And what we played, however many games in the Prem, that's a lot of games already. Um, he said we need a cage there because he wants to go out, train and play. We need to calm him down because he's so willing. It's the way he is, the way he plays. It started with the national team with a kick. Then he had a knee issue. After that, he lost a lot of things because of the injuries. He had to play more than we wanted. And then he got an issue in his groin. So sometimes when you get one injury, you seem to have a little knock-on effect, people. And that was my concern over Timber. Because how many times have you seen a man come back from a long-term injury like an ACL? And I'm no physio, so I'm just saying random stuff. But... They start picking up hamstring injuries, muscle injuries in training, let alone playing games. I'm not sure, people, but yeah. We were led to believe, you know, Gabriel Magalhães first. It was a knee injury. Then it was a um, concussion. Maybe we've played him into the ground. Arteta did say it's now a muscle injury. Big Gabby has not had a muscle injury before, but he is playing a lot now. He is travelling, going to Brazil. He's a starter with Brazil. Um, so it's a madness, people. You know, we're dealing with a lot of injuries. Tini's back from an injury. Lewis Skelly's done very well, but he's actually coming back for an injury himself. Obviously, Zinchenko's picked up knocks. We're having to nurse Timber and Calafuri as well as Gabriel. Tommy Asu has been a no-show. As you look, no, Benjamin White's had surgery. It's an absolute Mazzellini, people. And I think I speak for everyone. We're third place Arsenal. Obviously, Liverpool have a game in hand and a four-point gap. They're laughing. I don't think Fulham are going to beat them, but I would love that. And if Fulham 
are able to make Liverpool slip up. Chelsea are second, Arsenal are third, City are, 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 are fourth. You know, you have to look at how the teams are playing and don't get it twisted. Liverpool have a very healthy points gap, but nobody's really out of it at this moment. But sticking on Arsenal, we're third place with 29 points, three wins and two draws in our last five. We're currently on the weekend after beating Monaco, going to be playing Everton, who have 14 points, three wins, five draws, six losses, people. Um, we need to be winning that. Like, big up Sean Dyche and Everton, nothing but respect. It's the set-piece derby. We know what Sean Dyche is going to do. We know, like us, they can do things from set-pieces. Sean Dyche is never going to be known for his expansive way of playing football, but they do have players there. Dwight McNeil can trouble us. Dominic Calvert-Lewin, I think, excluding... Uh, sorry, Dominic Cavalloon, excluding Dwight McNeil, I think is their top goal scorer. They've got the core. They've got, you know, they've got a couple players that can play ball and they've got decent players in the end room, very street smart individuals. So they're not going to bend over backwards for us. But considering their form and what we're trying to do, this should be business as usual. Football isn't one on paper. We need to go out there and do this thing. Both teams really are struggling to keep clean sheets. Clearly a lot more with Everton. I, I think Pickford and David Raya both have five clean sheets. So it all depends. And it's not been a plain, an easy season for Everton. Obviously, I don't want to go all the way back to August, but, you know, they've been getting battered. There's been a number of, at least twice this season against United and, and Spurs, they've, they've held four. You know, they've not been able to keep much clean sheets. Um, on the road, to be fair, drawing with West Ham ain't the worst. Drawing with Brentford as well isn't the worst either. They did beat Wolves in their last game and they do. They would have played Liverpool, which was postponed. But you look at their like, next couple of games, I'm sure their, their, their fans are maybe a bit nervous. You know, you've got to travel to Arsenal. Then you've got Chelsea with what they're doing under Maresca. Manchester City, cool, they're probably there for the taking um, with how they're performing. But it's still Manchester City. Nottingham Forest, one of the neutrals' favourites this season, along with Fulham, performing very well. People are, are are putting a bit more respect on Bournemouth and Areola, especially if you've got to go to Bournemouth. So I said it's, it's it's time where they got to stand up to be counted. They're flirting with relegation. They're playing poorly. Uh, a lot of players are out of contract actually, and I'm sure you know Arsenal have a scalp on their head. And to be fair with you, if I was Sean Dyche, it's not that I would hate on Arsenal or hate on the set piece culture or anything, but. And obviously, people hate on the fact that we score from set pieces. But if I was Sean Dyes, I, there's a lot of plaudits. As much as there's haters, there's a lot of plaudits for Arsenal with corners and set pieces, which I'm grateful, grateful for. If I was Sean Dyes, I'd be saying, hang on, I've been doing this for years. And they called me negative and that and this, that and the other. I'm going to show these lot how to do this set piece thing. And to be fair, against Fulham and Monaco, they kind of marked us from set pieces a bit better. I know Saliba tip technically scored against Fulham, but you get the point I'm alluding to, right? Um, again, people, when you look at some of the statistics, people, um, as I was saying, this is just my notes. You look at Everton, they're ninth for tackles. They've got six losses this season and only three wins. They're 15th place, we're third. They have Bournemouth, Nottingham Forest, City, Chelsea, and obviously us. Since he joined Everton in February of 2023, they have scored 31 Premier League goals from set pieces, excluding corners. They've netted seven. 73 times in total over that period and that means that 42.5 percent of their goals under sean dice have been scored via set pieces among the teams to have scored 10 plus times under a specific manager in that same time frame no other side have netted more than 31 percent of their goals from set pieces second to dice um and Everton and everton were rob edwards and luton at the time and then you look at luca teggy and west ham they've got eight goals from set pieces people only us have better than that people but four of those set piece goals came in one game so where are you at with that they've conceded 21 times i'm not being funny ask questions don't get twisted dwight mcneil Running at our defence, let alone dead ball scenarios is something to think about. Dominic Calvert-Lewin as well. They've got the core rate. They've got quality. But they've conceded 21 times. Uh, it's unacceptable for us not to score. Especially after, you know, different... It will be a different game. I don't think Everton are going to set up like Monaco. But let's try and break down low blocks and things like that, people. Where you look at Dwight McNeil as well, people, he's certainly one of their threats. He's got 13 chances created from dead ball scenarios. That's only bettered by four players in this league. Their top goal scorer has three goals, which is only too shy of Saka and Havertz, no? I think them two have five. Um, after a run of four defeats in five Premier League games against Everton between 2020 and 2023, Arsenal have won each of their last three games against the Toffees, which should continue. I almost forgot we had a bit of a blip against Everton. With the greatest of respect to Everton and Everton fans in my 29 years, business as usual, I'm sure Everton's the team we've beat the most. 
I do hope they stay up because us and Everton, the only teams that ain't been relegated. Everton have won just one of their last 28 Premier League away games against Arsenal, losing 23 and drawing four people. They did pick up victory in April of 2021. Arsenal's 102 wins against Everton is the most any side has beaten another in the English top flight history, people. While... What does that say? Wow, their 344 top flight goals against the Everton Evertonians or the Toffees is also the most. This is the first Premier League meeting between Arsenal and Everton kicking off at 3pm on a Saturday since December 2011 when I left secondary school or a few months before that. A 1-0 win for the Gunners at the Emirates courtesy of Robin Van Pagan. Robin Van Pussy. Sorry, Robin Van Persie. Apologies. Arsenal have won 81% of their home Premier League matches in 2024. Losing one, drawing two, winning 13 of the 16 played. That's their best home percentage in a year since winning 84 percent of their games in 2007 so long may that continue and then where you look at the lineup people i'm in two minds i'm not Mikel arteta of course it's irrelevant irrelevant what i think but i think lewis get the only reason i wouldn't start lewis skelly is because i think maybe you lean on more experience maybe dwight mcneil is a tricky customer um and things like that Maybe Califuri is fit. And obviously, as I said, Lewis Skelly is coming back from injury. And also, you've got to remember, he got significant minutes on a Wednesday. Give or take, depending on where you read, it says it takes 24 to 72 hours to recover from a football game. So maybe he's struggling a bit in that regards, being a young man learning this. But at the same time, for me, he's shown against... Whether we've won or lost or drawn, he's shown against um, Liverpool. He's shown away at the Etihad where he tried to take off Haaland's head and he showed against Monaco that he's built for it. So could you argue playing with him? I don't think Mikel Arteta will do that, especially if Kivio plays because there's been a lot of changes at fullback. But I wouldn't be against Timber. Timber. Uh, for this, Lewis Skelly and Calafuri inverting and doing what they're doing, that probably would mean Rice would play in this in the eight. Part A would be back in midfield because you could shift Timber to the other side. I I must admit, I am tempted. Do you go Trossard? Do you go Martinelli? Especially if you're going to play Lewis Skelly, do you get Martinelli? Because I know he's not been doing the business in the final third, but going the other way, he's quite good. Trossard's probably still our best finisher at the club, regardless of statistic. Do you bet on Gabriel Jesus? Yes, he should have scored goals and whatnot. But even though the bar's on the floor, surely it was a step in the right direction, his performance against Monaco, and he did get an assist. Definitely not dashing him up front, but do you play him on the left? You know, it's, it feels like a long way away from now. But I remember Mikel Arteta speaking about the partnerships of, did say about Trossard, but Gabriel Jesus and Kai Havertz. And typically, if this guy, Mienko, plays, he typically has a decent game against Saka. So maybe like the Monaco game, we're going to need a lot more from our left-hand side. We know what time it is. Typically, Rice will, will obviously make those runs. You have the left-back inverting part, it would be there. But I, I think there'd be too many gaps. I do think you'd need Kivio to show a bit more courage on the ball because you got it in your locker you're shown against United and Monaco you got a good pass you know Gabriel is this should have got you one of the assists of the season to be fair but against Fulham I don't think he was doing that so you could argue you could go with a lineup like this and there's very different denominations of it I must admit though when I got beyond when I kind of settled and, and stopped my hype because I would like to see Lewis Skelly I know people won't be fine won't be happy with this necessarily but I must admit it's not my first choice but I, I am not against Timber going staying at left back and part A at right back. I'm genuinely not against it. I'm not against Moreno, Declan Rice, and, and Odegaard getting another start purely because Moreno will be the guy making those runs. Rice will be back in the six. Obviously, part A would probably in that example be inverting. And then give or take, you know, we'd be making a back three. Or if Timber goes and does that, obviously it'd be higher up the pitch, but you get where I'm going with 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 that, people. You kind of see a denomination of that. So I must admit, I'm not against it. Kivio's done very well in this run, mini running he's got. I just wish Gabriel's back. He makes us a lot better defensively. He's more progressive on the ball. He's a level above Kivio. He's one of our best centre-halves and he's a threat from set pieces. And that's no disrespect to Kivio because there's a reality. As much as I'm talking about Timber and Calafuri and Lewis Skelly, Kivio might just go left back. And 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 Gabriel and Saliba are centre halves, and you do what needs to be done at right back. I don't. I'm not necessarily against party at right back, even though I don't want to see it. I do think we'll see it against Everton. But the main thing with me, beyond the obvious, with Moreno starting, and I must admit, I wouldn't say Moreno pulled up any trees against Monaco. It's just because you're going to be told to do that, and that again. Declan Rice is just going to be the six. Declan, just, just be the six, man. So we need to beat Everton with the greatest of respect, man. And, and they need to get wins. They might be looking at us as, as a privileged team. We're talking about 
and crying about winning or not winning a the league. They're fighting for their lives, trying to stay in the division. And, you know, I don't think Everton will get relegated. Apologies there, people. I don't think Everton will get relegated. But where you look at the relegation race, hey, Man United, you might get drawn out. Man United, boy, you know. You know what? Football's funny. City probably lose to Man United and we definitely got to get a watch along going, ooh. And this is why you can't draw too many conclusions 14, 15 games into the season. Like, you look all around, whether it's the Champions League places, you know, Europa League, Conference, all of that kind of stuff, relegation. No one's pulled away. If anyone's pulled away, it's Liverpool. And they're only four points clear of, of Chelsea, for argument's sake. You slip up against, against Fulham, that's cut significantly. While City, you know, obviously, if Liverpool win, they're even more away from it. But all it takes is Liverpool to buckle twice in quick succession and it looks different i don't think they will but my point just being boy it's it's close it's very close it's very close i thought poster coglu and them and they won the league in september so i'm not sure why they why why they're failing now people but it is what it is and did you not see poster coglu absolutely ripping to verna man united are struggling west ham are struggling you know west ham wolves you know these lot are struggling and you feel to be fair i feel the next manager to get sacked indirectly it could be Eddie Howe you know but I actually think Gary O'Neill and obviously the West Ham gaffer if they haven't clipped Luka Tegi already I might be wrong but yeah Everton are fighting for their lives look at the relegation race you know Ruud van Nistelrooy it looks like there's a new manager bounce and he's doing his thing at Leicester hope Palace stay up but boy and that's why Everton want to win because obviously you still can't draw any conclusions but you get three points which I hope isn't the case couple of other teams bottle it behind you you start to move away the relegation race is Southampton you're gone I hope you beat Spurs but Southampton you're gone you're gone you're absolutely gone I hope I wouldn't mind Wolves staying up but it's a draw out I must admit I did think the three teams that got promoted are the next would, would go back down but yeah I think Southampton's the only one mathematically I still I think Ipswich are gone I think now I'm starting to believe Wolves could be gone I'm still going to stick behind the three promoted teams go back down but there's always a great escape I wouldn't mind Ipswich staying up. Big up on Mari Hutchinson and Liam Dilap, and I'm a big fan of how their manager manages. But yeah, Wolves are just in trouble because they're not necessarily playing well. The manager, Gary O'Neill's looking like it's breaking. I'd say right now, there's two places for relegation up for grabs, man. Southampton are gone. I just don't think they've got the quality. I just think they're gone in it. Ramsdale's going to get another relegation on his CV. But at the same time, five points versus nine boy you'd have to go on a mad run you could claw yourself out of that but boy it's peak but one thing for sure certain with with Southampton I hope you beat Spurs in your next game so yeah people man it is what it is man what would you lot do for the Everton game as well especially in the back four